martial excellence under King Ashurbanipal gave the great Neo-Assyrian Empire its popular reputation. However, even further into the ancient past, early Bronze Age people of Ashur earned fame and dominance through a completely different aspect of civilization, commerce and trade. Welcome to our video on the merchants of old Assyria, how they operated, and why their activities may have led to the rise of one of the Bronze Age's most iconic Anatolian empires. Bronze Age history is often shrouded in time, but the sponsor of this video and our most loyal partner Magellan TV is here to help you with that. We've been enjoying our Magellan TV subscription and hope that our viewers will love it too. Magellan TV is a documentary streaming service run by filmmakers that has over 3,000 documentaries, among them hundreds of historical documentaries. If you're looking for more Bronze Age history, Magellan TV's four-episode series called Eternal Egypt talks about the mysterious history of the ancient land, and the three episodes on ancient inventions is perfect if you want to learn more about the chronology of scientific breakthroughs. You can watch both anytime, anywhere, on your television, laptop or mobile device, and it's compatible with most devices. Our viewers can now take advantage of an exclusive offer, 30% off an annual membership. This gives you an entire year for less than $3.50 a month. Every documentary we've watched has been worth double that, and there are now more than 3,000 in the Magellan TV collection. This offer is available to returning users too. Simply click on the link in the description to claim your discounted annual membership today. Support our channel and do that at try.magellantv.com slash kingsandgenerals. Start your free trial today. After 300 years of Akkadian and Gutian dominance, the Swan Song of Sumer started in 2047 BC with the Third Dynasty of Ur. It was marked by brilliant advances in scribal administrative tradition, reorganization of the military, and the flourishing of literature. The urban expansion led to Ur's peak population of 200,000, making it the largest city that the world had ever seen. Unfortunately, a combination of climate change, internal strife, and Amorite invasions led to the empire's destruction. The climactic blow landed in 2004 BC, when the Elamites put Ur to the torch. This marked the twilight of a new age, during which independent city-states were locked in a mix of conflict and trade. The decentralization prevailed across the wider region, in coastal Canaan, the mountain lands of western Iran, and crucially for our story, Anatolia. One of the small polities which first matured during the period was Ashur, a small city on the western bank of the Tigris. Ashur, at the dawn of the second millennium BC, had no more than 15,000 citizens. Unlike the highly populated cities of Sumer, it did not have the agricultural base to develop. The city and the small amount of territory it controlled lay on the wrong edge of Mesopotamia's greatly productive zone. Rain-fed farming was not capable of sustaining crops in Ashur's lands, but the terrain was suited for the herding of cattle. Nevertheless, as historian Ameli Kurt praises it, Ashur was an important nodal point in trade routes connecting Anatolia to Sumer and Iran. Lacking a massive population and a strong army, the kings of Ashur instead leveraged their commercial potential and geographic position. Texts discovered at the city of Ebla suggest that merchant caravans from Ashur were transporting vast quantities of tin as early as the 24th century BC. To bolster the markets of Ashur even more, savvy monarchs such as Ilishuma and his successor Irishim gave Sumerian traders tax exemptions on certain products and a number of other privileges. One consequence of this economic boom was the expansion of the Assyrian mercantile network. A particularly promising destination for Ashur's enterprising traders was Anatolia. Most of the source material illustrating what occurred during this fascinating period originated at an archaeological site around 1,200 kilometers northwest of Ashur, near a city which was known as Kanesh during the Bronze Age. At the turn of the 20th century, cuneiform tablets began appearing on the antiquities market, artifacts written in the old Assyrian dialect of Akkadian. This alerted archaeologists to the existence of a site from which these documents were being extracted, 
and they quickly set out to find it. A breakthrough was made by Czech Hittitologist Bedrik Hrozny in 1926, when he designated the origin point of the tablets to a small site 90 meters northeast of the main mound at Kultepe, central Turkey. Kultepe rises to a height of 20 meters above the plains surrounding it. With a diameter of just over 500 meters, the strangely smooth-sided hillock stands out in the surrounding landscape. In reality, the smaller site discovered by Hrozny was a settlement of expatriate merchants whose homeland was the faraway city of Ashur. It was a separate Assyrian quarter to the main settlement of Kanesh, itself a large circular city with a palace which was in ancient times built atop Kultepe proper. Since 1948, when thorough excavation began, over 21,500 tablets excavated from this unique site and two peripheral ones have given us a rich understanding of this period and in particular about the relationship that the site's former inhabitants had with the native peoples. From the Kanesh documentation, we know that at the turn of the second millennium BC, central Anatolia was dominated by several Hatti kingdoms known as Matu, of which Kotepe's denizens inhabited just one. Bordering Kanesh, for example, were Berushatim and Wesusana, south of the kizil Ilmak Basin. The territories and spheres of influence which each of these realms controlled cannot be determined with such patchy and unreliable information. However, we can be more certain about their internal structures. Each had a capital city and an area of surrounding territory which the polity's ruler, the Rubam, nominally controlled. This overall ruler was a broadly monarch-like figure who exercised varying amounts of authority over semi-autonomous peripheral settlements, the colonists of Kanesh and other Assyrian guest enclaves among them. Most or all of these intercity mercantile enclaves were in contact with one another, even possessing a kind of collective hierarchy, with the Kanesh Karim, as it was known, sitting at the very top. Other prominent cities of Anatolia were also accompanied by Assyrian Karim, while smaller townships may have played host to a so-called Wabatum, around a dozen or so caravanserai-like way stations. An extraordinary exchange of communication between a new Rubam in Wasusana and the city's local Karim gives us an example of just how this complex hierarchy worked. When this regional ruler notified the Karim that he had just succeeded to his father's throne, he sent an offer of renewed trade treaty with it. However, the reply this Rubam received shows us that even the highest strata of Bronze Age Anatolian society often had to be reminded of the complex Assyrian mercantile practices and procedures that had to be followed even by him. In this case, it seems that the local Wasusana officials did not have the autonomy to treat their local strongman. We answered, the Karim at Kanesh is our superior. We shall write so that they may write either to you or to us. Two men from the land will come to you, and then they can make you swear the oath. The eagerness of Hatti rulers to engage with merchants was motivated by the main commodity supplied by the Assyrians, a mysterious metal known as Anukam. Although it was once argued that this enigmatic material might have been lead, we are now almost certain that it was tin the Bronze Age's equivalent of crude oil. Relatively rare, and only available in certain places, tin was used in the creation of bronze, the eponymous metal of the era, which was used to craft almost every tool used in daily life – weaponry, kitchenware, farming equipment, and many other necessities. Lacking an indigenous source of this priceless strategic material, Rubam, such as those present in Wasusana and Kanesh, were instead forced to fall back on imports. The most feasible method for the Anatolians to import tin was engagement with the Assyrians, who in turn probably obtained it from the mountains of southwestern Iran, ancient Elam. On top of this, traders from Asher also supplied fine woolen textiles from their native Mesopotamia. Crafted in pieces, which were each around 4 meters square, only a small amount of them were produced in Assyria itself, while most were created in Babylonia, a land renowned for its fine quality of fabric. 
the Mesopotamian civilizations had what might be called a secret formula for creating their textiles, part of which has been passed down to us in a letter. This document was sent by a high-ranking Assyrian merchant in Anatolia named Puzo Ashur to a weaving woman in Ashur itself known as Wakatum, and details this process. The fine textile which you sent me, keep producing similar textiles. Send them to me with Asher Idi, and I will send you half a mina of silver each. Let them comb one side of the textile, they should not shear it, its weave should be close. Compared with the previous textile which you sent me, process one mina of wool extra in each piece, but keep it thin. The other side one should comb only slightly. If it is still hairy, one should shear it like a linen cloth. While Bronze Age Anatolia was indeed deficient in some vital resources like tin, the land did have a number of natural resources to exchange with their Assyrian partners, who after all weren't there out of good-hearted charity. They wanted a healthy profit out of the deal as well. The region which would eventually become Roman Asia was praised by Cicero almost two millennia later as a land of great wealth, fruitful for the many goods which could be extracted from it. Assyrian merchants were keen enough to notice this, specifically coveting Anatolia's copper, silver and gold reserves. Such precious resources would be obtained by exchanging tin and textiles, and then sent back to Asher as a type of ancient remittance. Booming commerce such as that between the Assyrian Karim and their Anatolian hosts gave rise to financial institutions which serviced and further enabled the marketing of goods. We know, for example, that a system of credit equivalent to our business loans existed in the region. However, with interest rates ranging from 30% to a staggering 180%, these services might best be compared to modern-day loan sharks, exploiting desperate or recklessly enterprising individuals. Sometimes the debtors were forced to sell their family members into slavery to dig their way out of the financial hole. Tensions between creditors and borrowers seem to have been an understandable source of social tension within the Anatolian kingdoms. When this became especially bad, Rubams repeatedly tried to ameliorate the issue by cancelling all debts and resetting from a blank slate. As a precautionary measure, creditors would write up contracts binding people to at least part of the loan, even if the Rubam voided all debts. In the case of a family who owed grain and silver to a man named Perua, the contract states, if the king cancels the obligation to pay debt, you will pay me my grain. The surviving texts also inform us as to how Assyrian enterprise in Anatolia was conducted and how the Hatti responded and interacted with them. Operations were overseen by an arm of the Assyrian state known as the Bitalim or House of the City. This institution seems to have been a powerful assembly of Ashur's great trading families, who had a hand in almost all of the important policies enacted by the state. This included export taxes and diplomacy with Anatolian principalities near the Assyrian colonies. However, the distance between Ashur and the trading colonies meant that day-to-day -day enterprise was in the hands of wealthy Assyrian entrepreneurs, known as Umianum. How these private investor-like figures ran trade was almost entirely based on preference. He could maintain a purely family-focused business, managing his people and products from Ashur, whilst sending younger male relatives to manage undertakings in Anatolia. Or he could form a cabal or consortium with other oligarchs, banding together to achieve monopolies over certain goods. Another relatively common option for the Umianum was to permanently settle in the trade colonies. Seeing better prospects for commerce and livelihood in the northwest, Assyrian merchant families might emigrate there, creating households, bringing their wives from Ashur, or even marrying local Hatti women. Whatever the specifics of each family and each private businessman, Umianum mostly entrusted the business to an operations manager known as Tamkarim who would decide which goods would be sold, where it would be sold, and to whom. The blue-collar employees of the Asher Anatolia trade network were known as Kasaru, caravan personnel who were hired to ferry the merchandise back and forth. Two-thirds of their year was spent as a commercial traveler on the road, 
while the remaining third, the winter, was their time off. The average trading caravan was made up of at least 200 people and perhaps as many as 250 black Cappadocian donkeys, each hauling an average of 65 kilograms of tin and 25 pieces of fabric. The merchandise was placed in two sacks, one slung on either of the donkey's flanks. The so-called side packs were not to be opened during the journey and may have been sealed to ensure they weren't. However, there was also a smaller saddle pack containing provisions for the journey, such as light snacks, animal fodder, private possessions of the traveler, and other personal effects. On the surface, the effort appears to have been worth it, as profits would often reach 100% from the tin and 200% when textiles were sold. As is the case in most commercial enterprises throughout history, however, the Kasaru and their business superiors were subject to constant taxation as they moved through different lands. 5% on textiles here, 3% on tin there. Sometimes local rulers would even claim the right to purchase 10% of a textile shipment before they were even taken to market. Royal palaces also had the only claim to extremely rare luxury items, such as the quasi-divine meteoric iron. In return for claiming such privileges, Various states would grant the Assyrian merchants privileges, including promises of protection and residential rights. Because they took on all the risks and made the effort organizing the system, Assyrian traders understandably wanted to keep as much profit as possible. To this end, they quickly started finding loopholes and using savvy tactics to prevent local rulers from leeching their hard-earned revenue. A standard way of bypassing the taxman was to leave the main highway and instead travel on side roads, known to the Assyrians as Haran Sukinim, translated literally as narrow track. These back roads were less likely to be under the active supervision of any regional polity and therefore could be used to avoid the arm of the regional power. However, there was a reason that such roads weren't popular with the general population. In part due to the lack of state control in these areas, they would likely be swarming with outlaws and brigands, ready to plunder the caravan's merchandise and potentially far worse. Going by alternate routes also meant moving away from established sources of food and water. Experienced Assyrian traders would share this knowledge with their other, less experienced countrymen who had to make the journey. A letter from a man named Bezezu to his business partner, Puzo Ashur, who was conducting trade near Hirama, advises such a course of action. He also advises another, more risky method if passage on the narrow track was not possible. Let the merchants bring all the tin in quantities of one talent each into the town, or make packets of 10 to 15 minas each, and let the Kasaru bring them into the town under their loincloths. Only after they have safely delivered one talent are they allowed to bring another talent into the town. Such unorthodox methods of smuggling could pay dividends, but were also incredibly risky for those employing them. Being caught by the agents of an Anatolian principality could lead to the seizure of all goods in the caravan and even imprisonment for its members. However useful the Assyrian traders were to the Hatti kings, they had to be incredibly careful not to make enemies of their hosts by cheating them out of money. In cases where merchants would violate agreements with rulers in such a way, the latter were quick to enact severe punishment on the perpetrators. Over the centuries, the wealth generated by Assyria's mercantile activities in Anatolia gradually began intermingling with other factors to provoke a profound political shift in the area. The different kingdoms slowly developed a greater sense of territorial consciousness. Where were the merchants traveling? Who had the right to exact tribute from them? If my neighbor has a monopoly over the trade routes, how can I take control of them? The many routes, roads and paths used by the Assyrian merchants also produced a regular web of communications throughout Anatolia, enabling ever closer contact between the Hatti kingdoms. This mixture of territorial aggrandizement, economic motivation and better communication led to the intensification of conflict among and within states such as Kanesh and Wessisana. The starkest example of this new era of warfare in the Anatolian world was Kanesh's destruction at the midpoint of the 19th century BC 
at the hands of a ruler known as Una, Hatti king of Zelpa, which was probably a small kingdom in the Pontic region. The destruction of Kanesh decapitated the network of Assyrian settlements, and as a result, the people of Ashur ceased all operations until stable conditions returned a few decades later. The return to commerce was short-lived, as a renewed era of conflict began around 1750, when a mysterious king of Kusara Anita waged a series of wars of conquest, bringing the Hatti world under his rule. This unprecedented regional centralization destabilized the economy, leading to conditions that were not conductive to a profitable enterprise, and the Assyrian merchants could no longer operate as they had done for centuries. By about 1700 BC, the merchant colonies were gone, but their legacy paved the way for one of the greatest Bronze Age empires, that of the enigmatic Hittites. More videos on the Bronze Age are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see the next video in the series. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.